but I see people mimic that approach in the sense of they contract or do some freelancing to build something for you know a family member or you know a family friend and similar deal that's a line item on your resume no interview required and all of those three you know an unpaid internship your own llc freelancing or contracting work are all quick ways that are in your control to differentiate yourself in the ways that are the the most meaningful to an employer Welcome to the Exponential Growth Podcast, where we demystify what it takes to break into tech. I'm your host, James Hudnall, and my goal is to highlight real-life examples of people with non-traditional backgrounds moving into careers they love, so you can too. Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Eric Anderson, a senior software engineer at Yum Brands, a content creator, a volunteer, and apparently the world's happiest software engineer. Eric, welcome to Exponential Growth. Thanks for having me, James. Happy to be here. Before we start, briefly introduce yourself, Eric. Uh, yeah, so as you said in the introduction, uh, senior software engineer and developer advocate at Yum Brands. I am also a co-organizer for the largest developers meetup in Dallas called the Dallas Software Developers Meetup Group. So check us out at meetup.com. I am also the host for the Junior Jobs Podcast, where we focus on similar to you, James, by actionable job search advice for new software engineers trying to break into tech, just trying to you know, pay it back wherever I can. Nice. Yeah, we'll have to compare notes after the end of the show because I'm all about learning how to, I guess, tell better stories. And why don't we maybe start with yours? I think I understand you've got more of a traditional path, but why don't you take us back? Like, what was it like growing up? Did you think you wanted to work in tech at that time? Yeah, so I, as any rebellious teenager would do, uh, my father told me not to get into software engineering. So then, of course, that became my sole passion and <laughs> direction in life. My father was a COBOL programmer back in the day, and he would always talk about how it was an industry that just eats their young, how it just ages <laughs> you so quickly. But it just seemed so interesting to me, obviously, the, the ability to be able to you know make your own world and bring your own ideas to life. So... Yes, I went the traditional route. I got a four-year degree in a computer science adjacent degree. So it was called information systems. And I even stayed on to do a, a master's degree. And going through that experience, I learned a lot about the, the job search and what you know, customers or clients, cus companies are looking for and have reached a, a point in my life and my career where I really don't think you need six years of education to be successful as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And I look around and I see so many people that are you know, struggling to make ends meet, especially with recent inflation, you know, people who didn't have an opportunity or the ability to take you know, four to six years off of their life to get that education. So now I try to help people who are trying to make that career change to get into tech so they can you know, have that better life that they've envisioned for themselves. Yeah, and I can definitely see you posting on, I think, LinkedIn almost every day, if not every day. You're definitely paying it forward, and I, I love that about you. But you're not going to get away with the Cliff Notes version of the story you gave us there. Okay. I want to <laughs> I I dive in more and maybe going back, not yeah. too far, but maybe when you're in high school. You know, you mentioned you're this rebellious teen. You're pursuing computer science, maybe despite your dad to an extent. But in all seriousness, yeah. did you see yourself really moving into that field and enjoying it? Were you programming for fun, kind of self-teaching at the time, or maybe reading books? Yeah, so my very first exposure to programming was with an, a little RPG maker video game tool as I was perhaps a little too much obsessed with the Final Fantasy series. And then it was StarCraft was my obsession, staying mm -hmm. up a little bit too late at night, but making little macros for that game. But then my first website was a Dragon Ball Z fan site that hosted a bunch of my favorite you know, aggregation of images and gifs uh, and you know artwork from my my favorite characters those are mostly WYSIWYG type programming experiences but it definitely influenced why i wanted to get into coding in college computer science i found was a little bit too hardcore for me so I switched from computer science and went to information systems, and I found that a little more practical and okay. pragmatic and easier for me to wrap my head around. 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I guess quickly trading war stories, hopefully not to bore the audience. Similar to you, you know, when I when it came time for me to declare my college major, I had no intentionality behind that. And also somewhat rebellious. My framework was what's the hardest major you can think of at the college that all your friends want to go to and are probably going to go to. And I'm like, okay, mechanical engineering at Virginia Tech. I live in Virginia. That was the one that everybody wanted to go to. And I got in, which sounds great, but you can you might imagine it turned out to be a, a train wreck in the end. Well, not in the end, but at least in the in the intermediate term. And, you know, I learned so much during that that roller coaster of an experience. I went from mechanical engineering, not really. I basically didn't have a GPA. And then I switched to English because I found it was a lot easier to just show up to class. And as much as I feel like I'd like to go back in time and maybe trade the time to study CS or information systems, because though that was my passion then, I am glad I went through what I went through just because I feel like it helps me, if nothing else, appreciate where I am today. So maybe my, my Cliff Notes version is a, a little <laughs> too high level there. I did change majors five times okay. between you know, CS and similar to you, had such a difficult time with it. I abandoned it, all of it and it went into pre-communications, public relations, okay. then advertising, something a little more creative, but I eventually found my, found my way back. So I think if anything, the one thing I am grateful for, and I think a lot of this goes to my how supportive my parents were since they were helping me pay for my college, you know, which I'm incredibly grateful for and I'm privileged to a acknowledge. Uh, I know not everybody can, can do that. But because of that, it took me a little bit longer to get my college degree as I switched majors so frequently, but it gave me the freedom to try out lots of different paths before I committed yeah. to, to any specific one. And then for information systems, I didn't even know that was a major until a girl that I was pursuing found out she was in the program and i was like oh that's kind of like what i started with computer science maybe that might work so i went into that program things didn't work out and then i figured after five majors i might as well ride this one through yeah finish and it out i'm grateful it, it, it finally worked out so maybe in terms of internships i'm not sure if you did everything right in that regard but i'm curious to to dive into that because i did not i didn't know yeah. what an internship was when i was you know a junior or senior in college just speaks to my naivety but what about you did you do that process sure quote unquote, right yeah if, if i can weave a, a narrative in here about like the job search in general that i think will Please. be helpful for a lot of new developers and that is first i just want to say even after graduating with a master's degree in information systems, I still had friends in my graduating class that took three to six months or more to find their first job in tech. So while yes, I think it is easier to get into software engineering if you have a college degree, it is not a guarantee of success. But there are certain principles of those who did start right out of school that I think can be applied to anybody independent of their educational journey, whether you're self-taught or, or boot camp or a typical college degree. Because what I've since learned after leaving college or even in, in the professional sphere, your alma mater and maybe the degree you got in that alma mater is really only important and helping you land that first job. And outside of that, it's all your experience. So it doesn't matter if you go to University of Virginia or University of Georgia or Brigham Young University to get a degree in you know, computer science. They're all the same and nobody cares. There are a few standouts like maybe MIT. So you might as well go to the one that's the most affordable and really the only thing that you're paying for is access to a pipeline of employers that that university has a relationship with. They have career fairs, they have internships negotiated with certain hiring companies. And that is the biggest differentiator for getting that first job. Yeah, I'm so glad uh, you went there. Now, the principles though, <laughs> for those that, that got that first job is that they were able to leverage that network the employees and employers in that network were mostly interested in previous work experience that we had as students. So this was 
for me looking at my own journey, I took a unpaid internship that was four hours a week where I was doing basic front end HTML, updating text and colors. It was, like, it was an SEO uh, specialist was the, the title or something like that. So I was you know, updating text for the you know, search engine. But it was that which led to me then starting my own company, just me, my brother, and my dad, where I was building a mobile app. And then I got hired as a teacher's assistant, building him a mobile app. So then by the time that I was looking for full-time employment, I already had three line items of work experience on my resume. And that was the biggest differentiator. Nobody asked about mm. my GPA. Nobody cared about my graduate degree. It was the three line items of work experience. So it was the students who were so focused on getting a 4.0 that they didn't do anything outside of school that mm. actually struggled to find a job. Interesting. Uh, anyway, so there, there's some elements there that I, I can dive uh, more into, but at least in my own advocacy, uh, I try to emphasize the importance of giving yourself work experience as yeah. much as possible because that's what people are looking for. Yeah. Why don't we maybe pull on the thread of the, the 4.0 students that were tunnel visioning, I guess, the curriculum and trying to become rock star, I guess, algorithm, data structure, by the book programmers where why do you think they struggled i think i have an idea but i'm definitely interested in your your own take yeah i, I like to hear your thoughts I, my own perspective was just what makes you successful in the american education system is not necessarily what makes you successful in life so for example the 4.0 student is typically really good at memorization right multiple choice tests and being able to easily regurgitate uh, information. And I'm painting in broad strokes here. I don't want anybody to sure. feel like, hey, if you got a 4.0, I, I think less of you <laughs> or anything. You're, you're great, you're intelligent, and I love you. But in general, at work, that's not the case. I don't need to have everything memorized because I have you know, ChatGPT, I have Stack Overflow. What is more important is my ability to work well on a team and collaborate, my ability to think creatively about a solution, my ability to communicate my ideas effectively. So if anything, I was not a 4.0 student, but I wish I had spent more time networking with my graduating class and developing relationships there. I wish I had spent more time building projects with other students and learning things like Git, you know, for example. Um, I wish I was focused less on memorizing something for passing a test and actually practicing that skill, that tool, that framework, that language enough so that it became, it became part of who I was. Right? Yeah. I, was I was so focused on just you know, passing the class that I, I never yeah. really took a step back to really learn the material. I've heard the saying, I don't know that I agree with it entirely, but it's, you know, you've got A students and C students and something to the effect of the C students are likely the, the business owners down the line that hire the A students. And again, yeah. that's, that's way too broad of a brush, but I think it speaks to your point. And that was the headline of the episode right there when you basically summarize the American education system where I think for most intents and purposes, they mean well, but to your point, there are so many other dimensions to you know, being successful at work, both in your first job and, you know, in your own trajectory, what I think, where you've gone from being a junior dev to, you know, you've had management experience onto the senior level. So you can speak to this better than I can, but there's so much more to it than simply rote memorization, just like you mentioned. Yeah. And I, I can, I have a little soapbox here about the, the education system. I got to be careful of, right? But there are so many elements there in general, like there is one right answer when you, when you take a test or do an assignment, whereas in life or, or as a programmer, there are so many different ways you can implement something. There is yeah. rarely one right way. There are best practices, common practices, what have you, but the tools, the frameworks, the languages are so different and so specific to your system that it, it's hard to you know, make abstract, abstract generalizations yeah. about what is right, the right way to do something. Or your, your teacher is the one who knows the right answer you know, my manager, while I love him to death, does not necessarily know the right answer. And I, I can push back and we can negotiate. We can co-ideate something together. 
in school when an assignment was due it was like a hard deadline. But at least in the software engineering space, all of my deadlines are negotiable. Like yeah. if I, I can estimate something high and get more time to do it, I can estimate it low and get, you know get it done quickly. And if other priorities come in, I can push out lower priorities. I don't have to work you know ungodly hours to meet arbitrary dates, with the exception of legal deadlines or like financial reporting dates. Th those are concrete, sure, but everything else is just a, a conversation. So when I think of my own journey, I have a tendency to be a little bit of a rule follower and mm -hmm. a worker bee. So I kind of burnt myself out early in my career because I was approaching work like I was approaching school when hmm. really I should have been pursuing it much differently. I'm starting to understand why you're the world's happiest software engineer and I'm taking <laughs> oh, that, this now. <laughs> I, I've learned to set my own boundaries and stuff to make sure that I don't get that don't get burned yeah. out again. I have that title happiest software engineer because perhaps at one point in my life I was the world's unhappiest software engineer and and something that makes sense. had to change. Yeah, I love that. Now, before we move on with your story, I want to ask you, given what you know now, if you could go back in time and let's say your 18 or 19 year old Eric graduating high school, do you think you might pursue a formal CS degree or do you think you might do things slightly differently? I'm not trying to lead you. I don't think there's a wrong answer here, but I am genuinely sure. curious what you think you might do. Knowing what I know now, well, a CS degree would be easier, right? I am grateful for the path that I took. Similar to you, you mentioned it kind of makes you who you are. It's hard to imagine your own life any differently. But I wish I was more active in my free time in coding. Because that was where, for me, the real learning happened. Two years into learning to program, uh, I was still in the TA lab with a teacher's assistant kind of hand-holding me for every assignment. Hmm. You know, I had really no understanding of how things were working because I was copying from other students and I was having the TA help me on every little thing. And I was so scared and I was so frustrated. I already changed my major so many times and I had to finish with something. What was I going to do? But then luckily I broke my foot and I broke it pretty bad and I, I you know, went to the ER and I couldn't walk for a few months and I was, you know, bedridden. Uh, I couldn't really leave my apartment, put it into a boot and I couldn't make it to campus. And for the first time in my educational career, I had to figure things out myself. Hmm. Uh, I couldn't attend lecture. I mean, this was only, you know, a decade ago. So virtual school is not really a thing. You had to be there in person for, for your classes. And my friends would email me their notes and I had their notes and I had the internet and I had to figure it out myself. And I realized after, you know, a week of struggling, all of a sudden the whole world opened up hmm. and what took me two years of struggle in that one week, like all of a sudden everything got unlocked in my mind because I was no longer just like watching tutorials and, following somebody else. I had finally had to, you know, push through and figure it out myself. Yeah. I just want to highlight that before we go on. And to those listening, it, maybe it seems obvious, maybe it doesn't, but I've also found Eric that with some of the biggest growth that I've experienced in multiple areas of my life, you do have to go through that struggle to get to the other side. And again, in, in retrospect, I guess maybe it seems obvious, but it's also not easy to hear that when you're actually going through that. So I just wanted to, again, come back to that, highlight that to anyone out there listening. If you're struggling, you're supposed to. It doesn't make it feel a lot better in the moment, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it's one of those things where in hindsight, I'm grateful for the experience. Yeah. But uh, well, I, it's I think you mostly, in the moment. <laughs> you mostly answered my question. I'll let you get away with that one. So why don't we maybe move on to the, the first developer job you landed? I don't know if you remember the interview mm -hmm. process. We love talking about interviews, even better if you bombed it. Maybe you didn't, but what was that like, if you remember? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'm going to tell a, a series of little stories about a lot of the little jobs and internships I, I had along the way, because I think there there's some principles there that, that I like to highlight. So the first one okay. was the unpaid internship at four hours a week. 
Now, I know the, the unpaid internship is a controversial take that you are committing your labor for no compensation. And, you know, does that make sense in a you know, capitalist marketplace? You know, and not everybody can do it. And I acknowledge that. Uh, but what I want to say is that four hours a week, I was still able to go to school part time and I was still able to work part time to help pay my bills. Four hours a week really just meant I dedicated like one afternoon on one day to do what I was required to do. I am grateful for that experience probably more than any of the others because mm. it was a line item on my resume that differentiated me in every interview that I had uh, since then. I mentioned the other students in my graduating class who struggled to find work because they had no work experience. Well, I had at least that one. So that interview experience was pretty easy. They had applications on campus and you submitted your a willing body and they were not going to pay you. So they didn't really care about the quality right. that, you're, that you're producing. But the second job was me forming my own LLC with my brother and my dad. And the, obviously no interview there. We were building a mobile app based off of an idea that my dad had. My brother was the designer. But once again, this was work experience on the resume. Uh, LLC means it was formerly registered with the state, which means that if a recruiter was going to do a background check, it would pass, which meant that we did have a basic website that my dad set up, just you know, some you know, free template, Squarespace, whatever. And I gave myself the title software engineer. I didn't give myself the title CTO or founder. Mm -hmm. I gave myself the title for the job that I actually wanted to get when I graduated. Wow. Uh, so similar there, no interview process, but now I have a second line item of work experience on my resume that differentiated And this was a quick follow up there. So this was mm -hmm. intentionally, maybe if not completely for this reason to start giving you that experience that you knew you needed to break in. Is that right? It was primarily to help my dad, and he wanted the LLC because we needed a company name to put something in the app store under. Okay. Uh, the unintentional side effect, as we had started moving along, was, hey, I can use this okay. as work experience. Because, you know, when you're starting out, you have so little relative line items that you yeah. can put on your oh, resume. Yeah. Oh, I worked in retail. I worked in fast food. Nobody cares, right? There is some overlap in your soft skills, but you got to find a way to flesh out that resume in ways that are meaningful to the employer. Yep. So that was an unintended consequence. But because of that, I had now built a mobile app in the store and one of my professors found out. So he wanted me to build him one. No interview there either. But I see people mimic that approach in the sense of they contract or do some freelancing to build something for you know a family member or you know a family friend and similar deal that's a line item on your resume no interview required and all of those three you know an unpaid internship your own llc freelancing or contracting work are all quick ways that are in your control to differentiate yourself in the ways that are the, the most meaningful to an employer. Because if you come from a non-traditional background, if you go to something, I'm going to assume like a boot camp, which most people I talk to are doing some yep. sort of boot camp program. When you come out of that, you look exactly the same as everybody else. You have some education experience completely unrelated to the technical field. Then you have your boot camp experience. You have some personal projects that are all variations of kind of the same theme, and that's it. You have the same yeah. skills even listed on your resume. You gotta find some way to look different because why hire James, although James, I'm sure you're a wonderful human being in, in many ways, but like why James versus why not the other thousand applicants that I have for this entry level opening, thinking of it from a yeah. from an employer's perspective. Anyway. Those three, and then the fourth, I'll call this my first real job, was for a small startup working part-time. This was now actually 20 hours a week okay. as a mobile engineer. Okay. I know why I was hired, because I was the only candidate that had mobile development experience on their resume. Mm. They explicitly told me so, and I 
No, because they asked me to look at the pile of, of other applicants after I was hired and to pick other people to hire to work with me. And all of my experience was, was just formalized personal projects like the mm-hmm. LLC or even kind of that freelancing work contract work that I did for, for my boss. These, this wasn't like, yes, it was work experience, but it wasn't like work, work experience. Right. And that is where I realized and part of the reason why I advocate it to my network is just, you know, don't wait for some company to give you experience. Like there are ways that you can give it to yourself. And that interview process, what was uh, a behavioral interview strictly now two two rounds of kind of some behavioral interviews and then like a technical interview, but it was more like a Q&A. It wasn't a, okay. a data structures and algorithms. I feel like the data structures and algorithms thing, and this is just based solely off of my own experience, has really kind of taken form in the last maybe five years. Hmm. Back in my day, 10 years, to 10, 12 years ago, coming out of college at least, nobody was doing DSA. Yeah. So that seems to be like a, a, a modern or an artifact of the, like, of our modern yeah. interview culture. Yeah, I heard a, a funny related story. I'm not sure if it applied to Google at the time, but I think it was a it was on the, the Jocko podcast where someone was a, I think a manager at, I don't know if it was Pinterest at the time, but they had moved to Google and it was right as Google went public, I guess around 2005 or six. And I think the the company motto at the time was if you can get someone to actually interview, they're in. That's it. That's how the bar was <laughs> at that time, just because they wanted engineers wow, yeah. that badly. So yeah. to your point, it, it is interesting how things, I guess, especially from your perspective, have changed in the past five or six years. And to your point, like I assumed that I had to do that lead code grind with my own personal story. I never got to that point for better or for worse. I, I definitely plan on learning, you know, DS and algorithms that's on my near term radar. But I never had to do that dance just because of the the LinkedIn apprenticeship program that I uh, was mm-hmm. fortunate to land. But yeah, there's definitely multiple ways to do that. And I share your sentiment with, I understand why companies do the data structures and algorithms, but there are other ways to at least pre-screen, I feel like, candidates mm-hmm. in a way that's more representative of what they can actually do at work as opposed to under the gun. And this, this may not necessarily be relevant for entry-level developers. I, I hope it is, but this is my own interview experience in, in recent years. I have changed jobs since leaving college, and I have had to go through the data structures and algorithms gauntlet since then but i have never passed a technical data structures and algorithms uh, assessment but i've gotten every job offer and i as an interviewer back when i was a manager and as an interviewee now what i've come to realize is that a lot of it is just trying to understand how the candidate thinks so asking a lot of questions when you're given the prompt for the the DSA. I typically ask a lot of questions, which shows thoroughness of thought and completeness of vision. I usually then first write a few basic unit tests. You know, given this, expect that. And I confirm the expected output with the, the person I'm interviewing with. I talk through edge cases as I think through the solution they confirm or deny if I'm thinking about things correctly. I talk through high level what I'm thinking of doing and I get their feedback throughout. And usually by then, that's like half the interview. Yeah. So when it comes to the actual implementation, I maybe only get halfway through and I don't finish right. it. Right. But the feedback I always get was just, hey, Eric, we loved how you think. Yeah. So yes, a lead code grind is going to be important to depending on the company you're applying to. But part of it is also kind of understanding the, the psychology of the interview. Right. Uh, they're not trying to do some sort of gotcha question on you. They're trying to understand if this is somebody that they can trust to work on their system. So yeah. when you're asking questions, doing those unit tests and talking about edge cases, like all of this is just building trust in the employer that, hey, at least he's thinking about the right things. Yeah. I love that. I'm glad you went there. And I, I really hope that the people out there listening, you know, when it, when it comes time to do 
one of those technical interviews to Eric's point, it's so important to ask those questions and not to just immediately feel like you're under the gun to start coding right that second. I think I did two, Eric, not including LinkedIn. LinkedIn it didn't have like an under pressure coding challenge. It was a take home assessment. But the couple that I did before that, I, I felt that way. I, I asked a couple of questions, but I very much felt that pressure to immediately, you know, start almost thinking in code. And I love your take on that. And it makes a lot of sense. And I hope that people out there are really absorbing that the next time that they're in a setting like that. The take home exam was my favorite. Yeah. It's a, a, you know, being able to work with no pressure. I can use my own IDE. I can use the tools that I'm familiar with. I can look up help online. And then I feel like the take home assessment is for me, it was the easiest way to really just stand out as a candidate because yeah. they would say something like, Hey, here's a simple, you know, you know, make a simple web service or whatever. We expect you to spend no longer than five to 10 hours on it. Well, when I was looking for my last job, I would spend 20 hours on it. Then I would just double whatever they told me and I would make it awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'd have this really awesome read me. I'd have all these unit tests. Uh, I would you know, add some additional features they hadn't asked for, make it look pretty and, you know, most people are going to be doing the minimum there. Yeah. And part of that is I have to acknowledge the privilege there. I had some savings and I had the ability to take the time to put that effort into my job search, which not everybody has sure. you know, 20 hours that they can throw into differentiating themselves. So I'm just saying if you can, yeah. it's a great way to almost you know, guarantee that you're gonna progress on to the next step in the interview. Yeah, no, I share that sentiment. And I feel like I've only been in the industry, I guess a year and a half, give or take, but from the work that I've done so far, the take home assessment seems so much more representative of the day-to-day -day work that you're actually going to be doing as opposed to the on the spot, leak code, under the gun, finish it right now <laughs> kind of a deal. So I can definitely appreciate yeah. a, a good take home. So now you landed this part-time role. I'm not sure if you went from that to senior, or if maybe the management came onto your radar next, but do you wanna walk us through maybe that part of your career? Yeah, so I was working part-time for that consultancy, and it was a small shop, it may be 10 developers or less, and I was doing it while I was still in school, and then I graduated, and I wanted to learn how to code like a big boy. You know, we were all in college or, or recent graduates and we were doing things the best that we knew how, but I feel like I wanted some mentorship. I was confident in my ability to cope. I wasn't confident that I was doing things, you know, quote unquote, the right way or the best way. So this was through the school I went to. There was a career fair and you know, met a, a company there that I went through the interview process with. And that, just to follow up on a, a comment I made earlier, that career fair, that career services branch of your, your university, that's really, in my opinion, the most important part of the school that you're going to because that pool of companies that attend is really going to dictate where you're going to start uh, your career. And if you're going somewhere where you know an Apple or Google doesn't hire from, well, then you're going to have a harder time getting into Apple or Google. Right. And Because really, the, the quality of the, of the education and the university system is really going to be the same no matter where you go, in my, in my opinion. But all the companies I was talking to, they're mostly interested in the work experience line items that I talked about earlier. So I was interviewing with everybody. And I had friends that, you know, with a master's degree, were not getting interviews. That interview process was with a consultancy. What was really interesting about that is that it was perhaps the easiest interview process. And I, I try to point folks towards consulting and for software development for juniors because I think there's a, there's a great overlap. I say it's easier because they tend to index less on a specific t technical skill in a specific language. They're, most consultancies will deploy you to a new project every six to 12 months and every tech stack is gonna be different so they don't care necessarily about your proficiency in any specific one. And they focus a lot more on consultant demeanor and communication skills in the interview process, which kind of is a little bit easier to kind of you know fudge than specific technical skills because 
to them, your ability to present yourself effectively in a client setting is really that that's their revenue generating function. That's what they're trying to optimize for, not necessarily the te technical proficiency. So if you're coming from a non-traditional background, you have experience in another industry, you're older in life. My assumption is you have a lot of work experience, collaboration experience, communication experience on the table that a consulting firm may value. And especially if you're older, they can deploy you and maybe even bill a little bit more for you because yeah, the, the client doesn't know <laughs> necessarily that Your you're new to coding. To them, you, you look like, hey, you're 35 years old and I got yeah. you for like a low rate. Yippee yeah. for me. Yeah. At least the consultancies that I've talked to, they even make most of their money from junior talent. They'll hmm. pay you a junior rate and then they'll charge the client like a senior rate. That's their profit margin. Whereas the more experience you get, that that margin kind of shrinks a bit. Uh, so they're financially motivated to hire juniors. So with consultancies, I'm not sure how much experience you have in this realm. The only follow-up question I would have in terms of growing as a developer, and I know when I was still working at my last job, I was trying to integrate the things that I was learning in terms of code with that job. And they thought I invented fire, Eric, but in terms of CS <laughs> concepts, you know, it was not impressive at all. And to that point, yeah, yeah, in yeah. maybe different consultant positions, do you feel like there's room for the junior engineer to get the mentorship that may otherwise be provided at a larger company? Yeah, it depends on the consulting firm. So the one that I worked for specifically was a company called Paraveda Solutions. They, they're a great company. You know, I'm not affiliated with them or I don't necessarily endorse them. They're just a company that follows this methodology at least. But okay. since they made most of their money from hiring junior level talent, one, they hired a lot of them. And two, a lot of their work was repeat work and established relationships. And the way that you don't destroy those long running relationships is you make sure you have a very strong mentorship program built into your culture so that mm. these juniors can quickly get up to speed and not embarrass themselves. So at least at, at Paraveda, there was a, a very strong mentorship culture and a lot was expected of the junior developers. And there was a lot of a quick career progression for those that were right out of school. Okay. No, that's good to know. So was a, a consultant gig, was that your next play in your story? Yeah. Yeah. So I worked there for the next, oh gosh, six to eight years. Okay. That is where I progressed from being a you know, junior consultant to being a senior consultant to being, to going into management. Now, as far as progression in your technical skills, consulting firms, from my experience, uh, once you hit the management level, that is where you're not going to be coding as much. Uh, then your responsi responsibilities transition more to uh, start transitioning more to sales. Okay. Uh, so if staying close to the code and becoming more technically proficient is important to you, the consulting route is still great for maybe the first five years. And then at that point, I would recommend you, you jump ship. You're going to get a lot of variety. You get exposure to a lot of variety of technologies, frameworks, languages. That would be especially useful if you don't know what you want to focus on. In my you know, first few years when I was a developer for that consultancy, I had a, a Swift project, a .NET project, a, a Xamarin cross-platform project. I had a, a Java project, a Groovy project, an ActionScript project. Uh, a node and an AWS project, hmm. and you just, you know, some web, some AR, VR, some mobile, you kind of bounce around a lot. And then I kind of eventually found what I like to do, the type of company culture that I wanted to work in long term. And that was when I uh, decided to jump ship. And that's when I'm here at Yum and living my best life. That's when I switched it to world's happiest software engineer. I guess you probably prefer being closer to the code as opposed to your foray into management that you did. Yeah, I spent almost three years in management and it was the first time in my career where work felt like work. Uh, prior to that, I was just playing with toys all day. You know, coding is just like Legos, but digital Legos. And it was fun. Uh, you're learning a tangible skill, a skill that I can then apply to my side projects and personal ideas uh, to build out. And it was so energizing, so, so engaging, so much fun. 
And then I went into management and it was tracking finances and budgets. It was forecasting. It was resource allocation. It was handling issues and escalations and team conflict. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was stressed out of my gills, right? It was, I'm grateful for people that find energy in that role. And I'm grateful for great managers, but I learned that that wasn't fun for me. Yeah. And life is too short for me not to enjoy what I do every day. So I actually took a pay cut, came to Yum. I've since made up for that pay cut and more by focusing on more of a individual contributor, you know, highly technical route. But that was a scary decision, but one that ultimately led me to a level of greater personal fulfillment than I think I could have had if I had stuck with the other route. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe gives you a better or maybe a different appreciation for your manager and managers writ large just having yeah. gone through yeah. that yourself. Yeah. Can you maybe speak to the maybe the difference in terms of expectations and requirements for going from a software engineer to a senior software engineer? Because I think even if the majority of people listening might be still seeking that first job, I feel like this is still interesting to know, to to plan and chart their course. So from my experience, when I was first a junior, and this was something that I think I did wrong, and I may have been able to move a little bit faster, is I was so scared of failure, I would only grab the tickets that I knew that I could accomplish. And which, what that meant was I didn't gain exposure to the parts of the system that I would have needed once I became mid or senior. Because once you hit mid or senior, people start kind of expecting you to just know things. Yes, you can still ask questions, but you're kind of the go-to person and you're expected yeah. to figure things out. So I kind of I handicapped myself by not getting myself that exposure when I was earlier in my career. And it was safe to ask a lot of stupid questions. As a junior, people expect you not to know much. What eventually did happen was I developed some competency in mobile development. And I can do those tasks, those tickets really well. So then I got staffed on a project where I could lead a team of mobile developers. That's the other nice thing, I guess, about consulting is that since you change projects so much, there's constant opportunities for you to kind of revisit what your role is and, and what you do. I didn't have to wait for somebody to quit, get fired or die for me to you know, sure. move up in the, in the corporate ladder. But it was after having developed a proficiency with that language or framework, and I was trusted by my leadership to you know, be a mentor to other people that were fresher than me, that I was finally trusted at that, that higher level. I will say, though, I was already operating at that level before I got that promotion. And I would say, and this has been consistent with every time I've gotten promoted in my life, that I first did the thing before I got paid to do the thing. It's less about complaining to my leadership about not getting promoted. It's more about just actively finding ways to expand your influence and get better yep. at what you do and who you are. And the, the promotion will just kind of naturally follow. Yeah. Yeah, no, LinkedIn abides by that same principle. And that's also an action item for me, Eric. So thank you to try to tackle more nebulous JIRA tasks as opposed to those that are in my circle of competence such that I can expand mm -hmm. said circle and be ready when the time comes. So I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. This is the time to do it, my friend. Be, yeah. be better than me. Please, Jim. Why don't you talk to us, maybe talk about content creation. You, you seem so prolific between LinkedIn, YouTube, the podcast. What was your first mm -hmm. foray into content? So I've had a lot of different motivations over the years. But initially, this was March of 2020. I realized I wanted to go back and be an individual contributor again. Obviously, the pandemic is shaking up a lot of industries. It was shaking up consulting, which is where I was. And I was nervous about the future, which in many ways forced me to re-envision what success looked like for me and what my own career path looked like. Because up until that point, I was just kind of following you know, the path that you know, your company sets out for you, meeting objectives that other people set, but I didn't really have a personal drive or a personal vision statement, so to speak. But I started my job search, and at that point, you know, what, seven, eight years of experience, and I was surprised at how hard it was to find work. Mm -hmm. I figured with that much experience as a software engineer, I thought I did some incredible things, but I was not getting the interviews that I expected I would get, and I was not getting the offers that I was expecting to get. 
So following the advice of what I now advocate, and that is networking online. And I just started posting every day. My entire motivation initially was just to expand my network, meet new people who might be aware of job opportunities, connect with recruiters that were hiring, and that played out wonderfully. It was a lot of my my advocacy online and the types of content that I was posting that was stated as a, as a standout activity in my interview process for several opportunities that I was interviewing for. But then once I was hired, I figured I might as well keep doing this because what is it they say? It's better to, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second mm-hmm. best time is plant you know, an apple tree is now. Yeah. So I figured I'm happy where I'm at now, but let me just keep doing this because I don't want to be in a position like I was uh, previously where I didn't have you know, a strong network that I can rely on. And then since then, it's been a constant iteration as I've tried to figure out what people kind of want to hear. I talked at the very beginning at that point about more technical topics. Nobody seemed to care about you know, JavaScript optimizations or, <laughs> or whatever at least the network I had at the time. Hmm. I talked about mental health things. That's where the happy developer came from. I had learned a lot about my own personal journey. So maybe, hey, I can share some things there. Nobody honestly seemed to care there either. I guess most people were happy with their own lives and I'm, I'm glad. And then I made like one innocuous post about job search stuff. And like, Hmm. it was, you know, 10 X, the type of responses that I typically got. Like, oh, so then, kind of ever since then, I talk about job search tough stuff because <laughs> that's what people seem to want to hear about. I've posted every day for three and a half years. And I think yeah, I commented this on uh, one of your LinkedIn posts. For the first two years, you know, crickets, I, I wasn't getting much traction at all. But once I kind of found my niche after, you know, iterating on different topic ideas, that's where you know, in the last you know, year, year and a half, it's really started to take off. Yeah. I mean, it just speaks to the, I guess, the persistency and the consistent showing up every day. And you can, I mean, the results are evident. You know, you've got 30,000 followers on LinkedIn. Is LinkedIn your primary? I understand, again, you've got the YouTube, the podcast as well. Yeah, LinkedIn is primary. The other is I just started within the last five months. I figured I I might as well. I mean, I I think I have some great content. I might as well expand outside of it. LinkedIn, I started with because I was trying to find a job myself. So that's why. Sure. Uh, it's the, it's the largest audience. And then I was also sort of nervous at the very beginning and the LinkedIn, the people tend to be a lot nicer. We're all professionals trying to put our best foot forward. I was so nervous of, you know, putting something on Twitter and just having some toxic person come at me out of left field and just destroy my confidence early on. So yeah. I stuck with LinkedIn for a long time and that was yeah. like my safe place. Yeah. That's oh, so cool, man. Now, I know we're coming up on our time and I want to be respectful of yours, but before you get out of here, I'd love to throw you on the hot seat to better understand your psychology, if you're up for it. Sure, go for it, yeah. All right, first question. What does your typical morning routine look like? So wake up around 7 a.m. I have two little kids, a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. So it's helping them get ready for the day. That's all kind of resolved by around 7.45 At that time, it's breakfast, shower, and then I am a Christian, specifically a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so I either read the Bible or the Book of Mormon for 15 to 30 minutes, and then I jump into my day. And that that morning period is kind of like a a personal meditation to kind of help me Hmm. get myself in a mental place where I'm ready to tackle the, the challenges of the day. And then stand up, and I'm in it. All right, next question. If money didn't exist, what do you think you would do every day with your time? Oh, man. So back in, what was it, 2014, Warren Buffett offered a billion dollars to anybody that could guess the perfect March Madness bracket. I don't know if you remember that, James. I do remember. But since that moment, that prompted me, man, if I win this, what would I do? I am outside of software development, rather passionate about personal finances and a little disheartened by the state of the college debt crisis, which is one of the reasons why I talk about, you know, boot camps or alternative paths to getting a a successful career in life. 
I'm disheartened by the amount of medical debt that I've seen my own family accrue and just how limiting and debilitating that can be for, you know, starting to trying to launch your life in a successful direction. So our IP medical debt or a service similar to like that, I would start something like that where my entire vision would be to buy people's debt and pay it off for them and just essentially buy people's freedom from this debt machine that so many of us are just grinding out our lives under. So for lack of a better, I don't know what that would be called, but you know, buying people's financial freedom is what I would like to do if, if I could. Yeah. Give them a reset. I love that. I too am a financial mm-hmm independence and personal finance buff. We'll have to have a part two or something and go down that route. Yeah, compare notes. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah. do that with you. All right. What are your thoughts on Absolutely. Bitcoin? So I say personal finance is, is important to me. I should caveat that by saying I am a advocate for you know personal finance practices in established markets. I have Bitcoin. I consider it more like a play money you know, gambling even in a way, I, I only put money into it that I'm willing to lose in that sense. So I can only say my initial reaction is a little bit of uncertainty, not having the, the backing of, you know, a, a country, you know, like the, the United States that backs, you know, the dollar. So I've always been a little bit of dubious of it, but yet I, I do still have it just for fun. Yeah, not fair. Are there any books or podcasts that have had a big impact on you? So on my personal finance journey, and I know in certain financial circles, some of his advice can be a little controversial, but Dave Ramsey was a big name for me as I was trying to figure out my own financial future and helped me get out of debt. There's some tweaks that I've done to his program that me and my wife follow, but his book series and his podcast were incredible resources for me coming out of school. Because uh, I had the mentality of, you know, I want to buy the biggest house I can buy or the, the biggest car, the most expensive car I can buy. I have money. I want to buy things now to quickly realize that my quality of life was the same or worse than when I was in college because now I had all of this debt that I had to pay off. So my relationship with debt and my, my plans for my future have changed drastically based off of you know, my exposure to, to his content. Yeah. Well, the hedonic treadmill is, it's a vicious beast. And I'm glad that you came to that realization. I hope more people do as well. I feel like the world. Hopefully. Be, uh, yeah. It's a been a place. game changer for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would have liked to? Uh, I just want to emphasize that you're not alone on this journey, James. I really just want to appreciate that you're doing this. Uh, I think this is a great platform for giving new developers hope because there's a lot of There's a lot of despair in the new software engineering market right now with the big layoffs at the end of last year, with the difficulty of getting that first job in tech that we see now. I talked to a lot of people that are struggling. So I just want to say thank you for this. I also just want to throw a plug in, if I can, for my own podcast, Junior Jobs Podcast. Uh, I try to also post uh, weekly, talk to other newly hired developers or industry experts talking about similar topics to what we just talked about today, all focused on giving actionable job search advice relative to the the current market for new software engineers. Yeah, no, I love that. And I will be sure to add links to all the above in the show notes. And if people want to go and learn more about you, should we send them to one particular place or maybe any of those that you have? Uh, Yeah, I'll send you a link afterwards. So I have a a link tree that has a link to, you know, a newsletter YouTube, podcasts, you know, my social media profiles. That would be you know, a one, one-stop one shop for if you want to learn more about kind of the services I provide and, and whatnot. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. And again, Eric, you've got an awesome story, man. I really appreciate you being willing to come on and share it and would love to bring you back in the future and pick up where we left off. So thank you. Absolutely, James. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and I really enjoyed talking with you today. Thanks for listening. If you got value from today's show, please consider leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Spotify. It's a free way you can support the show and help other people just like you find the story and others like it. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow the show on whatever podcast application you use. And most importantly, 
If you know someone that might be interested in breaking into tech, tell them about the show.